Before we get into today's video, I do wanna let you guys know that this video is for educational purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody, anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope you all have had another wonderful week. I hope everybody is healthy, happy, thriving, and doing good and drinking your water, right? Right. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about a story that has fascinated me for so long. And I think a reason why it's fascinated me, other than all of the layers and different elements to this story, and I'm gonna tell y'all, we're gonna get there, is because this happened in a place that me and my family used to go to every single year. It happened in a place named Celebration, Florida. Have you guys ever heard of Celebration, Florida? If you haven't, let me tell you guys briefly about it. Celebration, Florida was created or designed or built by Walt Disney World Company, okay? Now, the way that I've heard it is Walt Disney, many years ago, he had all these dreams, right? Like Disney World and all these different things before he passed away. And one of them was to build an actual town that looked like it looks in the movies, right? Where there's like people are feeding ducks on the sidewalks and all of the trees are perfectly manicured and you know, people wave at each other driving down the road. It is literally right outside of Disney World is where Celebration Florida is and baby, it is not cheap either, okay? You know how much it is to go to Disney World? Ugh. Think about living in Disney World. That's basically it, okay? All these perfect houses. At Christmas time, they put up all the beautiful lights. They have Oktoberfest, but they have snow, like a snow season or fest or whatever there. And that's what we would typically go to. My in-laws lived in Orlando for a long time, so we would go there every Christmas and we would always go to Celebration Florida to be involved in all of the stuff that they did. I mean, they had snow coming down. I mean, they, they just really went all out. It is said that Disney has even paid people to sit on porches, wave, talk, just so you get the actual feeling that you are living in a movie, like the perfect Pleasantville type of life, okay? Well, people living in their perfect little community was not expecting what happened in 2019. So let's just start at the beginning. You know, a lot of people say that history will repeat itself. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not true. In this story, it seems to be true. Before December 2019, the Tote family was your perfect Instagram, Facebook family. We've been here before, right? With the Watts case and the Petito case and many other cases. Are we learning yet? Are we learning? Okay, the Tote family is made up of five people and a dog. Anthony, who goes by Tony Tote, which is the husband and the father, Megan Tote, who is the wife and the mother, and then the three children, Alec, Tyler, Zoe, and then Breezy, their fuzzy loving dog. Their Instagram accounts and Facebook accounts, and they had a business Facebook account, was full of smiling faces, you know, going on bike rides with the children, hugs and laughs and smiles. I mean, it was truly the perfect family. Before we go any further, I did want to stop and thank today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. Whenever you're connected to an unencrypted internet network on your phone, computer, laptop, or television, you're sending countless of pieces of information out into the digital world that can be seen and intercepted by many different parties before they get to their intended destination. That's why I use ExpressVPN, because ExpressVPN is a virtual private network that creates a secure tunnel between your device and the internet. And ExpressVPN also protects you from spies who use your data for their own nefarious purposes. Did you know that in the US, internet service providers can legally sell your data to ad companies? Oh yes. 
And ExpressVPN puts a stop to this by rerouting 100% of your network traffic through their secure encrypted servers. And ExpressVPN is so easy to use. All you gotta do is click the app and with a touch of a button, you are connected and protected. Find out how you can get three free months of ExpressVPN today by going to expressvpn.com forward slash Christina Randall, or just click the link down in the description box. Thanks again, ExpressVPN. Tony and Megan actually met when they were in college. Tony had a rough childhood and some things that happened, and we'll get to that later, but he really thrived when he got like into high school. I mean, he was voted most likely to succeed when he was in high school. He was the class president in junior and senior year. He was extremely popular, well-loved, and he worked really, really hard. And then when he met his soulmate, Megan, when he was in college, it was like a match made in heaven. I mean, they were both both going to school to do physical therapy in their little small town. They both got master's degrees in physical therapy and then they would go on to get married and start a business together family physical therapy. Now this physical therapy place that they had at their little town was so well known. I mean, you had people coming from all over. There were people, I read different reviews that customers or clients were leaving on their Facebook page and stuff that basically said that the totes saved their life, their children's life. Tony was really known to take time with his patients and, you know, listen to his patients. It didn't matter how old or how young they were. He did what he had to do to fix them and to help them. And Megan, not only was she working in there as a physical therapist, but she was also teaching yoga in their small community. And they were basically like celebrities. I mean, everybody loved them. Megan in her spare time even went and did physical therapy for disabled children, like would go and help them do house calls to their house. And Tony would do the same thing. But not only did he do that, he also volunteered as a soccer coach. And as you guys can see, we're really painting a picture here of like, oh my goodness, the perfect family, the perfect people. I mean, does it get any better? Picture perfect. Well, it gets even more perfect when Megan got pregnant with their first child, Alec, who ended up being a little boy and they were so excited. People were saying that knew them that they were like over the moon. Anytime they mentioned Megan being pregnant, she would show pictures of the decorations and everybody would come up to her and tell her how she was glowing and tell Tony that he was glowing. And it was just, it was wonderful. During this time, Tony promised himself that he was going to be a better father than his own. See, even though everything seemed picture perfect and it dang sure looked picture perfect in their community and online, Tony had a deep, dark secret that he was not willing to share just yet. Two years later, after the birth of their first son, they had their second son, Tyler, and they were just even more over the moon and happy. Megan was very much an earthy mom, I guess we would say. I mean, she made everything organic. She cooked everything from scratch. I mean, are you guys getting sick yet? I mean, Megan, I, I need a Megan in my life. I mean, everybody needs a Megan. Her family and friends described her as extremely empathetic, very kind, would talk to anybody. If anybody had a problem, it was Megan that they wanted to go to. Well, around this time is when Megan decided that she did not want to work anymore. She was gonna homeschool the children. She was teaching them art. She felt that art was extremely important and she wanted to teach her kids in the way that she wanted to teach her kids. Every day when Tony came home from running the business, and by the way, the business did so good, they ended up opening a whole separate one. So they had two in this small town and they had tons of employees, employees that just absolutely loved working for them and had nothing but amazing things to say about Tony and Megan. But now Megan has become a stay at home mom and her whole entire focus is to teach love and take care of her family and make sure her husband has a home cooked meal ready when he got home every day. In their neighborhood, their two little boys, Alec and Tyler, were like known as the sweetest, precious, most well-mannered children. I mean, these kids were so well-mannered that people would come up to them that they knew in the grocery store and be like, oh my gosh, your boys, they're so sweet. They would go into the neighborhood when it was snowing and help volunteer to shovel snow out of the driveways of like their elderly neighbors and stuff. I mean, they were just an absolute pleasure 
to be around. Megan and Tony started traveling with their two kids down to Florida and they would do what we would call like a snowbirds thing. Okay, so they were up in Connecticut and it gets freezing cold up there, snow and all that jazz. So Tony and Megan would take them and their two perfect precious little angels and they would go when it got super cold down to Florida and then they would spend time down there. They would go to Disney World, they would go to the beach, they'd go do all of that fun stuff and they were going back and forth so much that they decided that they wanted to get a condo in Florida so they could spend more time down there going back and forth from their business to Florida. Now, while they were in Florida, Tony was actually doing traveling physical therapy. So he would do house calls and stuff down there. And then he would go back to his businesses up in Connecticut. And it was just, it seemed perfect. Now things got a little weird, I guess you would say in 2010, when Tony's estranged father reached out to him on Facebook, he reached out to him and told him that he wanted to talk to him and he wanted to meet up with him. Tony really thought about this. I mean, he, he was an amazing father to his children. He wanted to give his dad another chance, but a secret that he had been hiding was that when Tony was just four years old, his father, Robert Tote, hired somebody to his mother. And it wasn't just that. See, Robert Tote, which is Tony Tote's father, was known in his community as the perfect man, okay? Are we, are we seeing the similarities here? Robert and his wife, Loretta, which was Tony's parents, were considered in the community as just the perfect couple. They had two children, Tony being the oldest and then his younger sister, Chrissy. Robert was the best provider for his family. He did a lot of volunteer work as well with disabled children and other people. And he was doing so good and he was such a loving, doting father over his two children and his wife that he told his wife one day that he wanted to go back to school and take night classes so he could further his education and further his family's life. And at this time, Miss Loretta was like, oh my gosh, like I have the perfect husband. You're so thoughtful. Yes, absolutely, I will support you. But what Loretta did not know was that Robert was actually having an affair, actually a couple affairs. He had this other woman thinking that they were gonna get married in April, and this stuff happened in March. I mean, literally, this woman thinks she's getting married, okay. And he was having an affair with a 17-year-old nurse. Now, this was back in 1980, okay? So 17-year-old, young, girl who him he's looking at her he's coming home to his wife who's got two kids on her you know putting her hands in her apron probably got flour all over you know stressed out here take the kids i'm tired i need a break and then you got young vibrant 17 year old nurse who's just got it going on and he's ready to take his wife out y'all i mean can we not figure out another way? Now, Robert knew a young man named John who was 19 years old who had a learning disability. Robert allegedly, now Robert still denies this to this day, so I'm gonna say allegedly, allegedly goes up to John and offers him $800 to take his wife out. Now, the plan was he allegedly got this 19 year old boy in his car, drove him to where his wife would be and said, look, that's where she's gonna be at right here. I'm gonna give you this piece right here. When she comes out, bang, bang, she's out. I'm good, I can get my young girlfriend and my other girlfriend and and, and take the kids and go. Okay, this is his plan. And the, the young boy is like $800 in the 1980s? Sounds good to me. Well, when it came time for the young guy, John, to do this, he got scared and he chickened out. And he goes back to Robert. He's like, listen, I'm freaking out over here. I can't do it. And Robert is like, okay, I'm going to give you the key to my house. At this time of this day, you come into the house, shoot her, and then leave. And I'm not going to be home. I'm going to be going and doing something else. And it'll be over with. Well, sure enough, just as planned, on that night, John came into the house. And it is said that he had another person with him, okay? came into the house and went into the bedroom where Loretta was and shot her in the face and it went through her eye. So I mean like in the face, in the head, through the eye. Now crazy thing is she lived. Four-year-old Tony 
heard his mama screaming, came down the hallway and saw all this. Okay, so you can only imagine how traumatized he was. She was rushed to the hospital and then when they started investigating it, they were trying to find out where the husband was and they found out he was at his mistress's house. So obviously he becomes the main suspect. Long story short, he gets charged with attempted murder and conspiracy to hire and da 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 da. They go and arrest the 19 year old boy, John. John turns state evidence, testifies against him. John, the one that actually shot him, gets four years. And Tony's dad, Robert, gets 10 to 20. Okay, now this is the craziest part. His wife, Loretta, stuck by him the whole time, y'all. Look at this newspaper clip right here. She did not believe that he really did this. Well, later on, her opinion changed. She divorced him, took her kids, and went far, far away. And then Tony hadn't seen his father since all of this. Now, it is said that Tony was in a lot of therapy over the years, which you can only imagine. You got to understand, too, when the person shot her, they left. Somebody had to call the police. I could only imagine what, what he saw. I mean, it was a lot. And it was hard for him to get over. So now in 2010, when he's done been through college, he's got two businesses, he's got a wife and two kids, and his father's reaching out to him, He's curious, so he goes and he meets up with his father. It is said that he met up with his father a couple times that year and then decided, yeah, I don't, I, well, for whatever reason, he didn't want to be in his, his biological father's life and he cut off all contact. A lot of people think that that was a pivotal moment in Tony's life, but I don't know. Let's keep going and y'all tell me what y'all think. So life continues to go on after that. Everything is perfect. Megan is homeschooling the kids. I mean, everything is great. They got plenty of money coming in. Okay. They're, do, they're traveling back and forth. They're on planes like it ain't nothing. Da, 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 Disney World every other week, it seems like. She's at home baking biscuits, all that good jazz. They go to Disney World. And according to Tony, okay... She got bit while she was at Disney World by a tick. We were vacationing in Florida and we were at a, a theme park and she got bit by a bug. I didn't see the bug. It was at the end of the day and this bug bite, which you would think was innocuous, turned into this just this yellow green, I, I can't even describe, pustule. It was a gigantic whitehead. So we went home that night. I went home to the hotel or it was a hotel at the time um, because of the issue. If you guys don't know about tick bites, they can be a bad mammer jammer. Do you hear me? A tick can be a, a, just a bite and it can get into your bloodstream the wrong way and cause Lyme disease and all other kind of stuff. And this is what allegedly, according to Tony, happened to his wife. She contracted Lyme disease and she got super sick. He said that she was in so much pain all the time from there. She was getting very depressed. And because of that, she was searching for ways to heal herself. Remember how she was cooking everything organic, wanting to do everything the home remedy way. Tony would go on to say that in her desperation to heal herself or to feel better, she started reading a book about a medical medium, okay? I don't know how many books like that there are out there. That's what he said. She went from traditional medicine she went to realistic, uh, religious following of dictating what her health care was. She even followed a book from a guy who listened to a ghost who had no medical experience to tell her what she should be doing, what she should be eating, and that kind of stuff. Called the medical medium. And this is when Tony said that Megan started acting really weird. She started to change. She started to become obsessed with the end of the world. This is all Tony's story. She started talking about, you know, needing to take the children's lives and her own and just doing different weird stuff. This is what he said, okay? I forgot to tell y'all that in 2015, they had a baby girl too. So now they've got all three of their kids. I read stuff online that was from friends of Tony that was absolutely shocked that he could have ever done anything wrong. And then when it came to his baby girl, these people that had nothing to do with like the media or the trial or anything said that when he found out he was having a little girl, he was over the moon. I mean, this man was at his businesses and his employments showing pictures of the bedroom. Oh my gosh, I'm having a baby girl, look at this. Oh, we're naming her Zoe, oh my gosh, I can't. just loved his kids. But also, in 2018, 
things started getting really bad at the business. Now, everything was perfect up until now, allegedly, right? Well, the checks for the employees at his physical therapy place started bouncing. Now, you know these people had to have loved the totes because they kept working even though the checks kept bouncing. Now, every time the check would bounce, they're like, bing, 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 bing. Hey, boss. <laughs> Hey, I need to pay my rent, sir. The checks keep bouncing. And Tony's telling them, oh my gosh, it must be something wrong with the bank. The money's in there. It's something, it's them. They've done it. And the people kept coming to work. I mean, they must have really, they must have really cared about him to do that. Because I'd have been like, hold up, swold up. <laughs> What's going on here? Well, it wasn't just that. Tony was taking out all these different loans from different companies in New York and all this stuff and like with really high interest rates and just pulling in all this money. And then you had people that were his clients that had been seeing him for years and then maybe had stopped seeing him getting bills from their insurance agency saying that, oh my gosh, you saw family physical therapy 10 times last month and they're calling their insurance companies and they're like, wait a minute. I haven't seen him in six months. And this is what sparked an investigation for fraud into the Tote family. The more that insurance started to investigate the Totes, they started to find out that the family business was racking up all kinds of money and insurance money that they were not doing the services for. It is even said that the FBI agency went and sat out in front of the business and saw that nobody came in on so-and-so day, but then yet Tony marked that he saw 36 people that day or 36 different cases. So he was charging people's insurance and getting the money for it, even though he wasn't seeing anybody. So the FBI investigators came to talk to Tony. Now, during this time, Megan and the kids were down in Florida in their vacation home. Now, this man, was known to be the best father and the best husband ever, but now he's got this little bit of trouble over here for this fraud and not paying his employees and all that. And his family's down in Florida going to Disney World with their Mickey ears on and they ain't got no idea. So when he sits down to talk to the FBI investigators about this, he says, oh, you got it wrong. So, uh, you, it must be a misunderstanding. Oh, I must have pressed the number accidentally more than once and the FBI agency's like, yeah, buddy. We see your type all the time. You're going to jail. And he's like, okay, hold on. Let me make this right. I, okay, I did do something. Let me uh, let me get my paperwork together and I'll give you everything you need to know. Okay, so the investigator's like, okay, I'll meet you back here at this date. Well, when that happened, he packed up all of his stuff, honey. He hopped on that plane. He went to Florida. It seems like had full intentions on just running from this issue in Connecticut of the fraud. He gets down to Florida and now we are in December of 2019. You remember at the beginning of the video when I told y'all this is when everything changed? It is alleged that his wife, Megan, picked him up from the airport. Not long after that, a text message from his wife's phone went to her aunt saying that they weren't coming there for Christmas. See, Megan and her aunt Cindy were extremely close. They talked multiple times a week. They usually went there every single Christmas. I mean, they were very close. So Miss Cindy's texting Megan and like, hey, it's December. When are y'all coming to visit? And Megan's phone, or Megan, Text her back and said, oh, we're not coming. We're going to go to St. Augustine. And Miss Cindy was like, okay. You know, she just thought, well, they're just down there having a lot of fun and doing Disney again. And okay. A few days later, Cindy is calling Megan, calling her, and she's not answering. She's not answering. She's not answering. Cindy's like, I'm starting to worry. Why are you not answering the phone? Megan texts back that she had the flu. The whole entire family had the flu. They were super sick and they could not talk. Now, Cindy thought that that was weird. I mean, she's like, okay, I've seen you sick many times in your life, but, you know, she was trying to be understanding and she just said, okay. Getting closer to Christmas, Cindy is calling, Chrissy, Tony's sister is calling, nobody is answering their phone. Finally, Tony texts back his sister and said, listen, Megan lost her phone. We're gonna be going off the grid, so don't call and we'll talk to you soon. Well, nobody heard from them after that. And this was definitely not like this family. I mean, you guys saw all the photos. There was for sure going to be some Christmas photos on the Facebook or the Instagram. And there was none. And this is when the family got really worried. 
On December 29th is when the first welfare check call was called in. Now, when the sheriff's office got there, nobody answered the phone. There was no lights on. There was no nothing. And they're like, okay, well, what are they going to do? They can't kick in the door. I mean, these are people that are known to travel. They could be anywhere. They could be in Hawaii. They could be mad at their aunt and not want to talk to them. I mean, it could be a million different things. So the cops just left. Now, on January 10th, another call was called in for a welfare check. And in this one is when they tell the 911 operator that they remember, they're like, man, it's all clicking now. They remembered that they heard Megan say that she believed that the world was ending. They go to do a welfare check. They don't see anything at all. They leave. On January 13th, however, is when the FBI came ready to knock that door down because they were there for the fraud situation, okay? And at this point, Somebody was getting in that house. And this is when everybody in the community, everybody in the family, the cops, the investigators, got a lot more than they bargained for. The cops showed up at the door and nobody answered. They jiggled the handle, they opened the door, and it came open. Good. Tony, you coming downstairs? Tony, you upstairs? Hey, come downstairs, bud. Alright? Yeah, take your time. Help? Everything's alright, man. Just stay calm. The cops said when they opened the door, they could smell a foul smell. Um, when we entered the front door, um, it appeared that there was no power to the residence. Um, it was dark inside the house, no lights were on. Um, the air was kind of stale and it had a strong foul smell. Um, I've investigated um, incidences where there's been dead bodies in residences and that foul smell is consistent with a dead body. They could hear somebody upstairs and they began to call out and Tony started to come down the stairs. Now, Tony was huffing and puffing like he could not breathe. Check this out. All right. Yep. All right, so just see. have a seat. You good? I got you. So have a seat. Megan. It's four. All right. Keep your hands forward too. All right. Megan. Walk over. Megan? Hey, Megan. Seven. Looks like that. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just stay still on it. I'm tight. You want me to get a chair for you to sit down in? <laughs> What's that? Hey, can you go out there and grab some gloves? When they went upstairs, they found Megan and they found the kids, but they were no longer alive. They were in the bed, all three of them and the dog Breezy, covered up with blankets, dead. And it was very clear that they had been dead for weeks. Tony had been living in that house with them, with them bodies. It's also said that there was an eviction notice on the front door. I, I see in a lot of articles as saying that they were behind $5,000 on their rent or their mortgage, but then I also seen that their mortgage was only $4,900. So it's like, what, did they miss one payment? And there, so, but the fact that there was no power in there is so weird. Now, this is the part where it, it's just giving me, this gives me Chandler Hol Halderson vibes as well as Chris Watts vibes, okay? He gets called in and he confesses this whole story. Now, the story that he confesses doesn't make total sense, but he was clearly out of it. I mean, in my opinion, he had some sort of mental break. I don't know, okay? Okay. But later, as he would be arrested and be in jail, he said that that wasn't true. He's trying to take up for his wife. We have heard this story all so many times, the, that his wife, Megan, is actually the one that took the children's lives. He said that they had a murder-suicide 
plan because of the end of the world and that he chickened out. I mean, there was just so, so many stories. I came home and my kids were dead. It was the most horrible day of my life. My wife died in front of me also. She was trying to explain to me what she did. She was trying to make me understand was she was trying to present this as fact. And I was telling her, I don't believe, that, and I can't believe I called her some names, which I never called her before in my life. But the whole demeanor of it was, this is what I've been told through my meditations. This is what I believe. I couldn't understand. And then after that, I was like, I want to get you help. I'll take responsibility for this. Just get help. That's all I wanted. I don't know if she did have some sort of thoughts of the end of the world. But what I don't think, I don't think she hurt her babies. Okay. I don't think that, but again, I don't know. What do I think happened? I think he had a psychotic mental break. Well, first of all, I think I should tell y'all the cause of death for the family members. It, they had a ton of Benadryl in their system as well as him. He had a bunch of Benadryl too, but they had a ton of Benadryl. But there was also signs of suffering. And he told the story, and I'm not going to tell y'all all the details. We will talk about some stuff over on my Patreon that's linked down in the description box if you guys want to come and join, as well as go over some crime scene photos. We're going to do that over there. But in one of his confessions, he said that his four-year-old baby girl, he gave her the Benadryl, and then he rolled his body on top of her and stuff her. Like, I don't know... I don't know if it's true. I don't know what he says is true, but that was one of the things that he said. Now, one of his children, as well as the dog, and as well as his wife had stab marks in them, okay? He would later go on to say that his wife stabbed herself. Ugh, I don't believe any of that. I think he had a psychotic break. I, you guys remember the Chandler Halderson situation? Remember how he had had this facade of being this perfect son that had this great job at SpaceX lined up and he had his, you know, fiance and they were planning on moving there and this whole entire thing, right? Like this was a whole thing. And then when he got busted on it, he killed his parents. I think this is very similar to this. And I think he already probably had that pre-genetic disposition or whatever you would say. A lot of things can be, have hereditary effects, you know, like addiction and stuff like that. There's a lot of things, you know, mental illness. And I don't know, I'm not a professional. I think we all know that here. Please do your own research, form your own opinions. But I do wonder if it was a combination of all of that. And it makes me wonder how much of his life was ever real. All those photos, you know. He would later go on to tell some investigators that the reason why he did the fraud stuff was because he wanted to keep up this life that his family was accustomed to. And if we can't learn anything from this video, this is the place that I want to say live below your means, no matter how much money you have. Live below your means. Always live, like, it, I was talking about this with my Patreons. If you can afford a $1,000 house payment a month, look for 800 I know we're in 2022, but I'm just saying, like, live below your means. You never know what he's saying is true. All of it could be a lie. He could have had 15 affairs on the side. We don't know. But he did get found guilty. He took it to trial. But the judge and jury did not buy it. As a matter of fact, the judge said that he is a destroyer of worlds. Okay? He didn't take it lightly. By no means. Tony ended up getting four life sentences for the murders of his wife and children. And then another year tacked on for the animal cruelty for the dog. He will never get out again, although he's trying, okay? He wrote his father a 27-page letter. Oh my gosh, a book. He wrote his father a book. And in this 27-page letter, he talked about what happened. To me, I'm not gonna read that to you guys. It is a lot, okay? But to me, it sounded a lot like him trying to set up some sort of like evidence, like hoping that they would confiscate it, say, aha, this is the confession that your wife really did do it and you didn't do it and take the cuffs off of him. He's innocent, let him out. Not gonna happen, especially in Florida, okay? So what do y'all think? The fact that he lived in that house with embodies for weeks, it is said that he was crawling in the bed with them and sleeping in the bed with his wife's body and his daughter's body. Oh my, the smell no power, the heat. He couldn't, have, he cannot be mentally sound and live like that. You just, he just can't. 
So what do y'all think? Let me know in the comment section down below how many of y'all needed this reminder that Facebook and social media isn't real. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you all so much for watching this video and I will see y'all next time. Love you guys. Bye. We are, we are dreaming in the dark. We are nothing more than dust.